Hi, everyone, and welcome to day two of HDCon 22. I'm Shelley Redman, CEO of the Huntington Society of Canada. It is my absolute honor to introduce these next two speakers. The topic is clinical trials in Canada, past, present, and future. Dr. Mark Gutman worked in the field of Huntington disease for over 30 years before retiring this past August. In his career, he also participated extensively in clinical trials, and his clinic was often a top recruiting site. Dr. Gutman is still actively involved in furthering clinical care and research advances in the field of HD. He is currently traveling, but has pre-recorded his portion of the session and will present on the history of clinical trials. Following that, we'll have the pleasure of hearing live from Dr. Tiago Mestre on current and future uh, clinical trials. Dr. Mestre is a neurologist and a movement disorder specialist. He is an associate professor at the University of Ottawa and scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He cares for people living with HD based in the Movement Disorders Clinic at the Ottawa Hospital. He has a significant research interest in HD and is the author of the first systematic review on therapeutics in HD, conducting multiple projects on development standards for rating scales and biomarkers to be used in clinical trials in HD. Currently, he is involved in Enroll HD and clinical trials of gene-based therapies for Huntington disease. And just a reminder that if you have any questions, please post them in the question tabs to the right, and we will get to them following the presentations. Enjoy. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, thanks for the organizers to offer me time to talk to the audience today. Uh, it's exciting. This is the second day of the second virtual meeting. Um, it's too bad that we can't get together in person. I always look forward to the uh, every second year events, getting together with colleagues from across the country and meeting patients and families. Uh, this is a special thing that the Hunting Society of Canada does. So we're talking about clinical trials today. And I know that you've already had on the first day, Dr. Ray Truant giving uh, his talk uh, I'm pre-recording this, so I haven't heard the talk yet, uh, but you have, and uh, I hope there's not a lot of overlap uh, with what I'm going to say. I've been asked to give some historical perspectives of clinical trials in Huntington's disease, and I thought I'd start off by talking about the general concept of clinical trials. So clinical research is a bit different than um, research in basic science. Uh, in that it usually involves a huge effort, usually uh, more than one place, uh, and so multi-site, and usually more than one country is involved, especially in rare conditions like Huntington's disease. When we do uh, clinical trials, there are some terms that we use that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, one is uh, a term that is often used as a randomized double-blind, placebo-controlled study uh, in, say, Huntington's disease. So let's break that down. Randomized means that uh, people are randomly selected to be in one group, one treatment group or another. And sometimes there's two treatment groups, placebo and active treatment, where people get the real medication or a placebo. Sometimes there's multiple doses of the active drug. And double-blind means that the individual receiving the, uh, the medication as part of the study doesn't know, but also the people involved in the ratings don't know either. So that the investigator, uh, people like Tiago and myself in the past, would not know who would get the, the, the drug so that there would be no bias. Um, controlled study means that there's a protocol that's set up uh, that uh, has rules and the rules uh, are very fixed and, and don't usually change during the, the program, but everybody has to same, follow the same rule book. So that includes what's called inclusion and exclusion criteria, and that defines who can get into the study uh, and uh, what kind of time frame the study is and what the outcomes are to be expected. So um, that's the, the general framing. Um, so clinical trials come in a number of different phases. So phase one is the very earliest phase where uh, we look at safety and tolerability, uh, usually uh, not in the condition that uh, we're, we're studying. It's usually in normal controls. But in, in Huntington's disease, uh, some of the invasive studies have been in Huntington's patients. 
Uh, so the lumbar puncture uh, oriented studies have been uh, in, in, uh, in the Huntington's patient population. Phase two is usually uh, looking at uh, a different kind of thing, which is uh, to see if there's a hint of effectiveness, but also to find out which dose works. Uh, or which dose should be selected for phase three studies, which are usually large. And uh, the outcome is that we wanna see if the drug is effective in the population. So uh, phase four is after it's been released. So most of the things that have been going on in Canada and around the world have been phase one, phase two and phase three, because there's really nothing that's being approved. Um, so, Outcome measure is an important part of, of Huntington's studies. So we have to determine how do we measure success? And success uh, is usually defined ahead of time. Uh, it may be improving symptoms. Uh, it may be reducing the progression of the condition. Uh, it may be uh, looking at other outcomes as well. So it depends on what's defined as outcomes, but outcomes are very important. And usually there's a primary outcome, the most important thing that's judged. And uh, in the recent studies, uh, that's usually been something called the total functional capacity. This is uh, specific for Huntington's and it looks at things like, okay, uh, can you work? Uh, can you do stuff around the house? Can you manage your finances? And we know that that total functional capacity score, which is the maximum score is 13. That's when everything's fine. It drops by about one point per year. Uh, and if uh, a, a drug improves that, that will be a, a slowing of that reduction. Sometimes there is also uh, something called the unified Huntington's disease rating scale. There's the motor aspect and other cognitive issues and behavioral things, and that can be used as well. There's things called secondary outcome measures, which are usually things uh, that uh, can be measured like cognition, uh, MRIs, spinal fluid uh, analysis, and those uh, are often called biomarkers. So I know that uh, Tiago is very involved with uh, biomarker and outcomes research and probably will talk more. So that's sort of the lay of the land um, with uh, some of the terms that we're using. I think we should be very proud that in Canada, we've been international leaders in doing clinical trials. And uh, I remember uh, in the early 90s, the first clinical trial that was going on had uh, patients uh, coming to Vancouver. And some of the patients that I remember seeing shortly after the genetic test was available in 93, were going to Vancouver uh, for a study that was hoped to be uh, neuroprotective or slowing disease progression. And that was with a drug called lamotrigine. So patients would go and would have all sorts of assessments on, over a one and a half year period, if I remember correctly. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work. But uh, that was one of the first historical studies that I remember. And Dr. Michael Hayden was instrumental in his team in Vancouver in doing that. Um, I think we should break down uh, the clinical trials that have historically happened, uh, especially in Canada, into observational studies, symptomatic uh, research or symptomatic treatment uh, research, as well as uh, what we're now calling disease modification research, which is slowing progression. Some people used to call it neuroprotective, uh, but this is the holy grail. How can we take the natural course of the condition and slow that down. Uh, some people would like us to stop it. Uh, we would all like to completely eliminate all the symptoms, but the reality is that if we slowed it down, that would be a good thing. We're not quite there yet. So a number of things happened in the 90s that many Canadian sites were involved with. Uh, there was something called the Huntington Study Group that the Huntington Society of Canada very much supported, it started in the early 90s. I remember going to the initial meetings uh, and uh, that was uh, groups of neurologists and psychiatrists and geneticists uh, getting together to try and have an operational framework and uh, a network to do clinical trials. And some of the earliest studies that happened uh, were funded by the National Institute of Health, uh, and we participated in both of them. One was called Pharos, and the other one was called PREDICT. And many of the people in the audience would have participated in that. Those were observational studies that had either uh, every nine months or every 12 months uh, assessments. Uh, PREDICT had MRIs, Pharos did not. 
Uh, Ferris was for anybody who could have the gene that didn't know if they had the gene, so they had a they were at risk, and that was kept uh, from the investigator and the individual as part of the study. Uh, Predict was for people who knew their gene status, and those went on for many many years. Ferris went for nine years, I think. Predict went for twelve years, and we have a, a very rich database of information uh, to to deal with based on that. That was followed by something called cohort. So many of my patients got involved in that uh, and registry was going on in Europe. And those things got folded into what we now know as Enroll HD. So it's a massive database. There's uh, 25,000 people in Enroll. Uh, they're coming for annual visits. There's blood tests done. And the blood tests that have been done for all of these studies have been put into a large data bank to look at gene modifying research or genetic modifiers that may slow or speed up uh, the Huntington's genes effects. And that's been a, a real success story from these observational studies. It's also given us rich data to be able to model uh, other studies that are being developed. And without those large studies that are still ongoing, um, we wouldn't have that. Uh, more recently, HD Clarity, which is a spinal fluid sampling study, I remember at the HSC meeting, the announcement of HD Clarity when Ed Wilde came on this uh, really cool uh, board that he was hovering uh, into the uh, audience and announced HD Clarity. And we were very proud that we were the first international site to start collecting spinal fluid. And uh, many sites in Canada are now doing that. And that's really important for research as well. So getting into symptomatic studies, there's been a series of symptomatic studies uh, that have looked at, uh, you know, could there be new treatment to help symptoms of Huntington's disease? Some of them have been successful. Some of them, most of them, unfortunately, have not. So uh, some of the uh, successful ones included um, the tetrabenazine study that was done in the States. Uh, we had tetrabenazine in Canada, so we didn't participate in that followed by something called deuterated tetrabenazine. Some Canadian sites participated in that, which was a slower metabolizing form of tetrabenazine that didn't get approved in Canada. And more recently, valbenazine, a study that was uh, has done, been done through the Huntington Study Group, uh, has announced its results showing similar success as tetrabenazine. Um, that drug is marketed in the States, but not yet in Canada. So th those are some things that are used to control motor symptoms, and we know that they can be helpful. Um, they tend to be very, very expensive, and it's sort of, I think, uh, we have to show to the Huntington's population that uh, these drugs are better than the older, cheaper drugs because these things cost a lot. There's been other symptomatic clinical trials uh, with something called prodopidine. Prodopidine was initially part of what's called the heart study, and in Europe, mermaid. And there was a lot of excitement because the heart study uh, they thought showed benefit. Uh, this is a dopamine receptor modulating drug. And, but they realized that there was uh, some problems with the data um, and that uh, finding was reversed. So they thought there was a hint of uh, improvement. Uh, so the same molecule was traded from one company, Neurosearch, to Teva. And there was a study called the PRIDE study that many Canadian sites participated in. And that failed to show a symptomatic improvement. Now, yet another company is trying the same drug, and there are sites in Canada involved in this, to use the same drug, prodopidine, to see if it could slow progression of Huntington's, which is very different than symptomatic improvement. Um, and we don't know if uh, that's going to be the case. There's a different mechanism of action uh, acting on a different receptor system that uh, is, is thought to be perhaps the, the, the reason why it may be helpful. Um, and we won't know that for a few years. In the disease modifying uh, uh, basket, um, very early on in the 90s, uh, there was a large program called CareHD. CareHD looked at two different compounds. Uh, one was coenzyme Q10, which as you know, is a health food product. Um, and uh, another drug called bromasamide. And this uh, study was complicated. You either got one or the other or both or placebo. 
And uh, that study, unfortunately, was not successful. Uh, there weren't any bad outcomes, but a lot of people were wondering, should they be on co coenzyme Q10? And there's no evidence for that. Uh, and there, it was extended later to uh, two care, uh, which is a higher dose. And a similar thing with creatinine was also there. Uh, but none of them have been shown to be effective. So I've gone a little bit over my time. Uh, I wanted to say, don't give up hope. Uh, the last year has been a bit of a roller coaster with all sorts of negative news, but there's all sorts of exciting things that Diego will talk about, and I still have hope. But we have to be fair to, to our patients and families. I remember in the early 90s, uh, shortly after I started going to Northern Ontario, there was a HSC annual meeting that a colleague of mine said, we'll have a cure in five years. We're not gonna make those kind of promises, but we really appreciate all the efforts of our families and patients to be involved in these clinical trials. It's a huge undertaking and thank you very much. I'll try and be available for question and answers later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to um, present at the National Virtual Conference following the, the, the historical introduction by, by my colleague, Mark Gutman. So um, I will talk more about, most of my presentation will be on, on the disease, the most recent disease modification trials. Um, So, um, Kelsey, I'm not seeing my presentation. Can you just adjust that, please? And so I, I'm trying to do a live presentation with with its risks. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay. These are my disclosures. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, and so. These are, are, if you access the Anton, Anton Society Canada site, these are, are, are the, is the landscape of clinical trials in, in, in Huntington disease across Canada. As Mark Gutman mentioned, um, I think Canada is in the forefront in terms of uh, clinical trials being present in, in, in many clinical trials in the past and, and also in the present. So Mark Gutman mentioned some of the informational studies um, that you can see in the slide presentation, um, including the Enroll HD trial, the Clarity HD trial, which is mostly an add-on study looking at development of CSF biomarkers for Huntington's disease, um, in a way, ways to better measure disease progression in, in Huntington's. Um, you see also uh, the mention of two trials that uh, Mark Gutman uh, listed, so the Kinet HD, which is the valbenazine trial, uh, but also the proof HD with the predopidine. And then most of my talk will be on the most recent trials of um, that I would lump together in uh, antitin lowering uh, approaches. Next slide. Um, so this is a summary of both the Kinet HD trial, so the valbenazine trial and the proof HD. Um, Canet HD, you've heard today that uh, we already have results. So this was a placebo controlled trial looking at uh, yet a new type of formulation of these compounds that we put them together in the group called VMAT2 inhibitors that basically deplete the brain of dopamine by, by avoiding it recycling it back into the neurons. And so we classically will have the tetrabenazine, which is available in Canada. Uh, more recently, the dutetrabenazine and really the main difference is the uh, how fast these drugs are metabolized in our bodies. Uh, and so valbenazine does allow a once daily dosing. So there's some um, advantages to that potentially. Um, and although now we know that the, the efficacy in terms of uh, reduction of chorea in voluntary movements is perhaps similar, uh, we still don't know about safety. And, and that has been... Uh, uh, something that we do tetrabenazine could potentially have a different safety profile, although there's really no head-to-head -head comparison. Regarding the proof HD, um, I will just mention that the trial is ongoing um, 
and is looking at changing functional capacity. So this scale in the uh, that we use classically for Huntington's, the TFC. Um, and so the trial is still ongoing. Next slides. Okay. So let's talk about Huntington teen lowering therapies. So this is a busy slide, but broadly, uh, you know, I would like to mention first. So it's a busy slide because there's different drugs being developed with this common approach. Um, and so you see uh, in these tags, each company that's developing a specific drug um, to try to slow the progression of Huntington's disease. And also you can appreciate that we can do that in different ways. Um, and, and why we do it is basically there's different checkpoints as the abnormal protein in Huntington's, the Huntington, it's synthesized from genes, uh, from the Huntington gene, both the normal and the mutated protein. And so we can intervene in those different checkpoints. Uh, and so, for example, you have the antisense oligonucleotides that at the level of the nucleus of the neurons uh, uh, allow for both the mutated and in some cases also the normal antintin not to exit in, outside the nucleus and, and be converted into protein. So this has been the program of, of Roche and, and also WAVE, which, is, which are the most advanced trials, and I will talk more about those. As you, some of you might know, it requires an intertecal and, and frequent dosing. For example, if you look at another mechanism, which is the RNA interference, uh, basically what we're looking at is the, the, the messenger piece of, of genetic material that's exit the nucleus uh, is now uh, inhibited to be synthesized into proteins. So broadly, these mechanisms do require uh, a surgery and to be inoculated the drug inside the brain, mostly, most, most of the times uh, targeting the basal ganglia, but it's a one-time treatment. Although we, and that compares with ASOs, which requires repeated dosing. Um, another group that it's, it's, I think has potential and, and some interesting advantages is the splicing modifiers. So these intervene still in the nucleus and, and by allowing a, a, an alternative processing of this bit of messaging that goes from the genes in eventually to, to the proteins, um, will allow, or it's expected to allow, a reduction on mutated Huntington. And fortunately, those, or fortunately, we don't know yet, so these are non-specific of the mutated allele. And, and actually, there's been some recent advances, uh, both for the Novartis and the PTC development programs. And two trials have been announced, uh, very, very early stages. Um, but I think you'll hear more of those uh, one interesting advantage is that these are oral administered drugs. Um, so in, in a future where you could potentially choose or a patient with Huntington's could choose, definitely having an oral therapy will be quite advantageous. Um, next slide. So let's talk about the programs that advance more. And I think many of you will have questions considering the, 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 the news we had since, uh, since March last year. And so... Uh, one, of, one of those programs is developed by Yonis and then Ionis and afterwards in a partnership with Roche that many of you will know by the Tommy Nursen program at this point. And so it's a non-allele specific antisense oligonotide strategy. So it reduces both abnormal and normal or wild type uh, Huntington. So its history goes back a few years um, and the first inhuman trial uh, try to establish safety uh, and tolerability of, of this drug, but also, uh, most importantly, try to see established target engagement. And in this case, it means uh, with ascending doses of this medication, we would expect a reduction in the mutated antintin in the CSF. And so that was done in a, in a study design that you'll see it's happening in other studies, what we call uh, uh, multiple do multiple cohorts of ascending doses. Many times it starts by a single dose, and then if safety and tolerability is confirmed, it goes on in having cohorts that are multiply dosing because 
with this technology, we do need repeated dosing. Next slide. And so these were the, 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 the results that, uh, that we first knew about these in human, uh, first in human trial. Uh, and so broadly it shows that it was well tolerated and, and, and it didn't raise safety concerns. Uh, it did show that target engagement. So for increasing doses of this medication, there was a reduction in the mutated Huntington in the CNSF. But something that I think at that point even, um, you know, definitely generated questions is uh, when you look at biomarkers, for example, uh, the size of the ventricles, which um, could represent uh, uh, brain atrophy, um, and looking at this biomarker, that also it's a marker of generation of neurons or, or neural, neurons dying, which is the NFL. Um, they did show in a in a time dependent and dose dependent fashion that the NFL seemed to increase, especially in the early stages of of administration of this drug. But also the ventricle volume tended to increase. Okay, and as you see that that put in perspective. Um, uh, might might have been a, a, a initial flagging for for the results we'll see in the next study, um, and in a way also shows how, how science is interactive, and 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 perhaps the biggest challenge is how to make sense of all the results uh, uh, to decide next steps. Uh, next slide. And so the, the this study led to a large uh, phase three study, so try to confirm the efficacy of this drug. Um, Clinical sites in Canada took part, um, and this this study looked at people diagnosed with Huntington's at the early clinical stage, and they either were given placebo, were given the drug, Tommy Nursing at 120 milligrams every 12 weeks, alternating with placebo every eight weeks, or always given uh, the drug. And as Mark Gottman mentioned, Last year in March was a little bit of a, a, of a, a haw and a little sensation of a, a, a punch in our stomachs as we heard that the study had been terminated. Initially, it was worded as an adverse uh, risk-benefit profile, and currently we do have some insight of what that meant. Next slides. And so. Um, the main results that have, have, have been shared both with the scientific community and, and patient, patient community um, was that patients that were more frequently dosed, so 120 milligrams, um, they seem to do worse. Uh, and that was shown with the primary outcomes. So this compositive UHDRS that tries to integrate in a single scale aspects of cognition, uh, functional capacity, but also motor performance. And these are taken from uh, uh, the scale we use frequently in clinical trials and in some extent in clinical practice called the UHDRS was a composite of that scale. So it really didn't have all the elements of that scale. And you see that's a tendency that, that maintains up to 69 weeks. And also the same for just looking at total, total functional capacity. Next slide. And seemingly, again, looking at the, the, the whole study, you see a similar pattern quite clear for NFL. Uh, and as, you, as I, I, I mentioned in the, in the first IONIS trial, we also had seen that increase in NFL, especially with early dosing. And that's what we see in this, in this uh, graph on the left. But also the aspects of increased brain atrophy for those that were exposed to the drug. Uh, at this point, there's, of course, questions that need to be addressed, What um, we still don't know. So one aspect is, is it just a matter of dosing and frequency, so the potency of the drug? Um, is this a mechanism driven by the fact that we're reducing both the abnormal and normal hunting team? Uh, other potential hypotheses, for example, that have been put forward is, are there any mechanisms that are related not to the to the reduction of Huntington, but uh, potential secondary effects of these ASO technologies, such as change in inflammation, that could 
drive these worst outcomes. So we're not talking about that there was no difference between placebo and active drug, but in fact, the, the active drug given more frequently at this dose of 120 milligrams seemed to be unfavorable uh, for, for these patients. As you might know, uh, uh, just this year, we also got to know uh, in the next slide, sorry, Kelsey. So looking at uh, what we call a subgroup analysis, so an effort to try to understand uh, what's, what could be the reasons that underlying these results. So Roche looked at uh, this index of age and CAP score. So CAP score is a is an index, is a measure that tries to predict the, the, the burden of disease and potentially the, the progression of disease. So a higher score means a, a worse burden of disease or a worse prediction of, of uh, disease progression. And as you know, age uh, is also a predictor of, of especially of, of clinical onset of the disease. And so looking at these two variables, they divided the, 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 the participants in four groups, considering a low, high age and a low or high CAP score. And uh, what they found, and I would like for you to pay attention to the left upper um, uh, graph, is that for those with low, so younger, and the low CAP score, so predictably a lesser burden of disease, um, they found they report a point estimate difference. So this needs to be uh, you know, understood very carefully is that statistically, there's no difference. And that's important to know. Of course, we're looking at a smaller group. So about a, uh, so about, uh, so much less than the total cohort. So there's some power uh, to the test significant differences that is lost, but still these results do not show a difference uh, uh, that is statistically significant, so that's not different from, from a random uh, result in this group. Of course, we do know that Roche sees this as a sign of hope uh, to the point of suggesting a new phase two study looking at the effect of this drug in people that are younger and they have less disease severity. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure it'll be interesting to discuss this in the question and answer period. Next slide. Uh, Another program, which is the WAVE program, uh, uh, tries to do a, a little specific uh, strategy. So looking only at reducing the mutated hunting team. Uh, so for this to happen, patients need to have not only the genetic test diagnosis, but what I call a fingerprint that is done by differences in, in, the, in the genetic code, what we call SNPs. And so... Um, this led the, the, the company to, to run two clinical trials, the, the precision HD1 and HD2, looking at SNP1 and SNP2. SNP uh, these trials also looked at um, trying to determine the target engagement and, of course, safety and tolerability. Next slide. And Canada took part. Unfortunately, in the same in March last year, um, we got to know that there was actually no proof of target or, or significant target engagement by these two uh, interventions. And again, the same month, which really, I think, impacted all, all of us in terms of, 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 of these programs. But as Mark said, I completely agree that uh, we are just starting. And, and, and definitely, uh, at this point, perhaps looking at the biology and genetic of hunting disease and trying to modulate it is perhaps the best and the one with most potential approach in terms of finding drugs that slow the progression of Huntington's. Next slide. And so with that in mind, um, WAVE, the company came back with a new trial. So um, this looks at the different SNP, now the SNP3, and you can see in the graph um, the, the prevalence of the SNP3 in the HD population. Um, and they come up, it's a different drug, potentially more stable and more powerful. Um, they have actually animal data looking at HD animal model showing evidence of target engagement. And this ongoing trial that also uh, centers in Canada taking part. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have more results about it. If there's uh, safety and tolerability shown with target engagement, likely it will 
lead to a, a phase three study. And my last couple of slides, next slide, uh, talk about a different approach. So uh, this, this study called CHILD HD, it's an observational study that tries to characterize better this phenomenon uh, of somatic expansion. So um, as some of you might know, uh, the mechanism of genetic mutation in Huntington disease relates with the number of repeats we have of this nucleotide genetic code of CHD repeats. The greater number of repeats, uh, of course, uh, at a different, at a certain cutoff, leads to a diagnosis, but also predicts uh, for those diagnosed with Huntington's disease uh, a earlier um, disease onset and potentially a more severe progression. Uh, but what the mechanism looks at is how changes that happen during the life of in that repeat can the progression and onset of the disease. disease. And so there's different genes that can be related with these uh, to try to prevent these mechanisms. They're called uh, DNA uh, damage repair genes. And one has been identified that could be related with Huntington's, the MSH3. Uh, Next slide. And so this company called Triple Tripitics actually has advanced in identifying a potential uh, 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 intervention that could modulate this gene and, and, and with that achieve uh, a disease modifying uh, uh, effect. Uh, this medication uh, will be administered also to a surgery. Um, uh, and, and so it does have that, that aspect that also will need to be taken in consideration. And, and with that, uh, I think, next slide. Uh, both me and Mark are will open for many questions that you might have. Uh, thanks for having me. Hi. Um, thank you, Diego. That was great. Um, I'm just looking at uh, some of the questions that are coming through. So one of the questions that's come up is, what clinical trials should we expect in 2022? So I'm actually in California right now, just getting ready for the CHDI meeting. We're having a whole session about uh, clinical trials and clinical trial results, and Tiago has covered uh, most of what's going on. Uh, Tiago, do you want to mention uh, for Canadians what studies are going to be available this year? Yeah, so so and and and, and feel free to to head also, uh, but so currently, so we have the the select HD trial. So looking by wave, looking at. Uh, 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 intraticularly administered medication. So that's one of the trials that is available. Um, so we currently also have available the proof HD study that uh, Mark mentioned earlier on. Um, in terms of the other trials, trying to go through the list, um, in terms, go can, ahead, Mark, you I might have. Uh, Novartis uh, it has actually started the oral anti-splicing agent uh, study. Um, and they, the intent was to do that in Canada. I'm not sure which uh, sites are available uh, for that. Um, PTC it will start their oral agent uh, this year as well. Um, and Triplet is planning a phase one study. Um, I'm actually the head of the data safety monitoring board that will be done through surgical intervention, uh, probably starting towards the end of the year. Um, so there are a number of studies that are coming up, uh, around. We've heard from Roche that their intent is to have a phase two study. We don't know when that will start. It may be towards the end of 2022. And we should never forget the very important studies with Enroll HD that is going on across the country for people to be part of natural history studies and HD Clarity uh, to collect spinal fluid uh, to enable research that will help build a better model for uh, many of these studies. Yeah. So there's another question here. Thanks for great presentations. I was wondering if you have observed any gender specific differences in HD in any trial or study. I'm not aware of any gender specific changes but we haven't really had the opportunity to look at the data in a way that, uh, that we 
would feel comfortable saying that there is no difference. Diego, do you have any comments? No, I, I was thinking the same. There's really no, I, I'm not aware of any specific gender based uh, analysis that uh, you know brought some significant that I would just mention you know, for the trials, all the lists that, that we mentioned, uh, some were still not yet certain if they'll be in Canada, but definitely actively advocating to bring those those trials um, to Canada. Okay, One of the things other... that uh, that's come up is you know the trend for a lot of these uh, programs is to go to earlier and earlier uh, points in, in the uh, spectrum of Huntington's, in, including uh, what we used to call pre-symptomatic. Uh, which you know, has been controversial, but people that have had their gene tests and have uh, carried the gene expansion. Um, and one of the things that's evolved is a different staging system uh, that would enable people that uh, have been tested and are currently not exhibiting symptoms that affect them to be part of clinical trials. So Diego, do you want to talk about this new staging system? Yeah, so, 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 so this was, it was a, uh, 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 an, an initiative uh, made together by CHDI and, and CPAT. So CPAT is a is a consortium that tries to bring together academics, industry, but also regulatory bodies. Uh, and and so the the effort was based on on the 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 wealth of data available for Huntington's disease, and and most of them, for example, comes from from those large observational studies that I think we are very fortunate to have in Huntington's. So uh, the, the, the project tried to establish criteria uh, that would allow to identify each subject, each patient that is diagnosed with Huntington's disease into a specific stage. And so, and as Mark was saying, as we try to bring it earlier and earlier, the, the availability of these trials uh, into the HD community, really need to have very well-defined criteria that would allow us to, to, to determine who could take part. Um, and, and also, I think one aspect that is not yet been developed, but it it's, will be the next step is how can we define, for example, if someone is deemed to be prodromal um, at the prodromal stage, how can we define how fast that person will progress to eventually having uh, clinical features of the disease, because ultimately that's, for example, one of the biggest challenges. We know that uh, there's, as Hurley has 10, 15 years before developing symptoms, if we use, for example, uh, MRI, we can see changes in people with, with has a positive genetic test. But as you can imagine, doing a study, testing a, a drug that, for example, the, the, the goal is to avoid the or delay the onset of, of the clinical features of Huntington's disease, uh, it will be impractical to have to have a trial running for 10, 15 years. So we need to find also criteria or, or biomarkers that allow us to, in a way, capture the stage where the likelihood of developing clinical features is is, is highest and is shortest because that's the point where we potentially can see uh, and, and document the therapeutic benefit. So it's very important that we're able to standardize this. And just to give a heads up, this will include cognitive testing and MRIs in the staging uh, as part of the, the setup for that. So, Jackie, there, there's not any preclinical or pre-symptomatic clinical trials so far, but we're trying to set the stage by validating this staging system. And also, there's a new rating scale called FIRST uh, PhD, or, or the earliest symptoms, because uh, we don't have a very good measurement tool with the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale uh, to be able to measure the earliest changes. So CHDI has been working on this new rating scale for that prodromal transition. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's coming up this year as well. So I'm going to have to end this as we're over time now. So I just want to thank you both, uh, Dr. Mestre and Dr. Gutman, uh, for a very informative session. Uh, we truly appreciate you sharing your clinical and research expertise. And now uh, it's time to proceed to the next session. So enjoy, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.